Today, Sarah and I are in Ipswich, Massachusetts, and this beautiful piece of property here was built by her grandfather for their six children as a summer cottage. I think this little tower up here was built specifically for the children to play in. I love this little view here, and I'm going to do an eight by 10 inch painting of it. I'm going to start out by using some charcoal, and I made a little few marks on here right now, but I started to draw it in line, in just line, and it just didn't seem to be working out. Then I thought, let me put in the big shapes with the charcoal, and this actually gives me a much better idea of what to paint as far as the, the big areas. So I'm going to continue for a few moments just by placing these big shapes in with my charcoal. And I found this just so much better than using lines like I have up here. That just didn't seem to give me the composition I was looking for. It was just too many lines and everything. But here I can visualize as a painting more the big areas that I need to work on. And I really don't think this is going to interfere with my acrylic paints, which I'm going to put over this. So I'm not too worried about that. Today I'm working with an eight by 10 inch board. This is masonite primed with gesso and I have toned it with some burnt sienna, which will give me a warm surface to start with. There, I think that gives me my big shapes and really opened up this area here for this beautiful gray sky. We have some rain coming in from the west. I think we're gonna beat that, but I like this. It's just very nice and subtle, very Massachusetts looking with this grayish sort of sky. So I think this is a good time for me to put out my paints while Sarah shows you around. It's really fun to be here again after so many years. This is my grandfather's house and he loved unique things and he made most of them himself. This is a nice whale door ornament, but it also works like this. You pull the steak bone here, lifts him up, and then um, close it. And then if you wanna get really serious, if it's cold weather and blustery and you wanna lock it, I believe you just turn this. These were hand forged. And I noticed up here is my grandfather's name, Arthur A. Shirtliff, 1908. So that's when he started the house for his wife and children. But as more children came along, he added on to the house so it got a little larger. I remember eating here with my grandparents. I think my grandmother made many of these chairs and they all have a little bit different design on the top so each person knew which chair was theirs. This room was the dining room and the sitting room and you could make it cozy in the winter if you were up here because this fireplace um, made the most of all the uh, heat exhaust by having it run a long way before it exited the house through the chimney. Over here Grandfather loved woodworking. He had a nice woodworking shop here with lots of beautiful tools and he also was very practical with space but he wanted it to be beautiful. And I believe behind here you could store just a little bit glasses in between the, uh, the vertical studs. And also I noticed some very attractive molding here and I can see he uh, drilled that and then uh, chiseled it out. So just a little more decorative feature here. This staircase goes to an upper level where they have extra sleeping berths. This rope, if you pull this rope, it will bring down a, um, uh, a hatch door. So that keeps the children up or perhaps it keeps the warm air down, I'm not sure which. And then you can also close it off with this nice little gate here. 
This was a pass through to the kitchen. You can see how nicely that's made and what a handsome hinge it's got here. This table perhaps was made by my grandfather or grandmother. She was also wonderful at carpentry and it's got the, the nice feel to it from years of love and wear. And here's another great way to use your chisel. So this would have been a hand chisel with a curve to it and she would have chiseled down like that and continued all along here and ended up with this nice design. Now above the fireplace, um, just above the mantel here, is a work of art by my Aunt Sarah. And she liked to find driftwood and other interesting items that had washed ashore and then she would see what it reminded her of and then she would combine them to, to bring out the beauty of the piece. And this one you can see has turned into a gorgeous horse's head. Just off the main room is the study. Come on, I'll show you around here. Here's another attractive door handle. This one I noticed has a carving on it. It says Sarah. And this would be for my Aunt Sarah. Grandfather would uh, recognize the birth of the children with special items here and there that he would add to the house. And this study could be extra cozy too because you've got nice wood stove here. Puts out a lot of heat, of course. And I particularly like the looks of all the ornamenture in here. And if you can get a look at the ceiling, you'll see it's slightly curved and has these beautiful beams that are shaped. Plus some nice carving here, all hand carved, of course. And here's a, some old novels and a, a hand carved box. Again, I'm sure these are small chisel cuts around here that make this lovely spiral shape. Well, Grandfather was a landscape architect and of course he loved the gardens and there's several around the house. They're smallish but very, very pretty and each one has a different personality and so I'll give you a look at some of them. Grandfather thought the windmill would be an excellent way to pump water from the well for the summer. And uh, the looks of it is great. I know it was a wonderful um, icon for us whenever we came around the drive. We knew we were at Grandfather's when we saw the windmill. What drew Grandfather to this property was the beautiful marsh view here. And he thought it would be such a healthy place for the children to play in the summer. And they always had such a wonderful time. My father loved it here. He loved playing with his brothers and sisters. and they built things and they went swimming and had picnics and made lemonade and camped overnight on some of the islands and uh, I love the property. It's very special. Um, this building is a little chapel for moments of quiet contemplation. There's a little summer house where the children could sleep in a screen porch. It's really a children's paradise. This really is a magical place, and uh, I think I'm ready to begin. I have my acrylic paints out here. I have titanium white, ultramarine blue, Indian yellow, and alizarin crimson. I'll start by putting in my darks with this very limited palette. I'll mix all three colors just to get a nice dark color. I could put black out here, but I don't think I need to. This the tree over here on the right is very red. I believe it's a Japanese maple tree. And this soft light is catching those leaves at the top of that just beautifully. But I won't deal with those lighter colors yet. I want to just put in these big dark shapes. And my main concern here will be to keep these shapes either cool or keep them warm. And of course to get the right values to start with. I'm going to make these values darker to begin with, and then we'll lighten them up as we go. Now over here we have grapes growing, so I will abandon that warm color, and I'll just mix up more ultramarine blue and Indian yellow to get this dark green, and just dip into my red slightly, because I don't want a really rich dark green there yet. I just want to get these dark colors. I'll add some richer greens over the top of this, and of course this is going to dry 
fairly rapidly. At this point, I'm so glad that I used these big shapes with charcoal. It gives me a much better guideline as to where to put these big shapes as opposed to just putting this in as, as a line drawing. And the charcoal doesn't seem to be interfering with these paints at all. Here we have even more green foliage here. So I may begin very shortly to start to lighten this or at least put more yellow in here. So right there, going to keep that dark right now because the interior of that bush is very dark. The really bright parts of that bush are the leaves which are catching the sun, which are on top of these darks. So I won't be tempted to put in the light greens quite yet. I have a big pine tree back here. I think it's tipping a little bit because I think they do get some strong winds here and maybe over the years these trees tend to bend a little bit and uh, keep that shape. Sometimes I get the feeling that a painting is going to come out well right from the start. Other times I don't get that feeling, although if I'm persistent, I can keep up with it and, and create a painting that's acceptable. But here, and I may be wrong, but I feel like I can do a nice piece. I think inspiration has something to do with that. I don't always rely on inspiration because if I did, I don't know if I would work that much because painting is a bit of a job. So I don't wait for inspiration, but here, this is a really inspiring subject. I'm scumbling this on so some of this burnt sienna keeps showing through. I don't want to lose the warmth of that burnt sienna that I have on there. We have some more dark greens right here beyond that little passageway. I'm using some thin, thinned out paint here. And you can see that burnt sienna is just glowing through there. We have a dark post back here. I'll drop that dark stone post tip there right now. And I think that would be very warm in color. I can just imagine in the earlier days when there were lots of children and activities around this yard, there was so much to do here. It was a great place for children. Had I not had this burnt sienna base on this, the whole painting would look totally different because if I were to put a wash like I am doing right now over the, the white board, it would just, it would look so much different. So I'm so glad I toned this board to start with. And here again, I'm going to keep this grass somewhat dark. And now I think I've pretty much established my values in this small painting. Now I think I'll start putting in some of the light. So I'll work on the sky next. I'll use titanium white and really just dip into my other three colors and see if I can come up with a gray that matches that sky. To me, that sky looks very warm. But so many days we do these paintings out in the bright sun, so it's a bit of a relief. And a nice change of pace to paint a, a gray sky as a, opposed to a bright blue sky. I think in this case it will help to give this painting a mood that it might not otherwise have, or at least a different different mood than, certainly a different mood than if the sky were sunny. I try and put my light colors on a little thicker than my dark colors because these light colors are opaque and they need to cover. I don't want too much of this background burnt sienna showing through, although a little bit of it showing through might be okay in the sky. I try and bring a painting to a finished point all the time. I don't want to leave anything untouched. I Personally, I like to work on the painting so I could stop at any point and pretty much say it's finished. I mean, it could be a finished sketch, but even at this point, I could say, well, I've got the information I need. I've got some of the lights or darks, but if I were to say, leave this totally blank and have just worked on a part of this, I wouldn't have gotten the same feeling from this so early on. I do tend to see some cool colors in these rocks. So I'm mixing some blue and of course my other two colors, but a little more blue than anything else. And I have some white in here as well. So I'm going to try and place some of these stones in this stone wall. This entire structure here was built with so much creativity and attention to detail. Now, I don't want to get all of these that blue color, but some of them certainly 
to my eye reflect this cool color. Okay, I'm going to warm this up by using my red and yellow and put in a few of the warmer blocks here. I'll vary the shapes of these because they are, of course, varied, but it's easy when doing a painting to make the same shape repeated over and over. So I have to be aware not to do that on these rocks. There, now I'm starting to bring the level of this painting up. Well, I guess I'll work on the stone wall up top. I think I will stay with my transparent colors right now. So I won't put any white in this little mixture of these three colors because all three of these colors here are transparent. Just put a wash on here and it's one nice thing about the acrylics is I can do that because this is, this is already dry underneath, totally dry there. So I can keep building this up with uh, different glazes. I'll take my spray bottle. I always test it out before I spray because sometimes on the first spray you get some big spots of water, big drops of water, which I don't want. Now these, this shadow under these eaves will be very warm because it's getting all the reflection from the, from the earth, from the ground. And that real dark shadow under that eave where the house turns. I will get out some cadmium yellow light. Now that's an opaque color, but I think I need this for some of the brilliant greens. I think I'll try and work with a dry brush on this. I'm just holding my brush on the side instead of this way. If I hold it like this, I tend to try and get more detail, but this, holding it this way, gives me a little less control in a way, so it uh, will give me the effect I want because right now I want to keep this all very loose. And it's not that I like to see paintings that are painted in a loose fashion, although I, I really do tend towards that. Uh, I also love paintings with, with a lot of detail. But at this point in the painting, uh, I find it better for me to keep it loose. If I work and get too much detail going on, then it means I have an investment of time in that. And if it doesn't come out right, I'm maybe a little more hesitant to go over and change it. So I'll keep it loose and keep the details uh, for the last part of the painting. And when I bring this painting inside, uh, it's going to look much darker than it will out here, even though the sky is overcast. So I do try and keep that in mind. Often I'll bring a painting in from painting on location and it just appears very dark to me. Okay, this is dry already. It hasn't been on there that long, but it is dry. And I'm just using a dry brush. When I say dry brush, I mean, it's just not really thinned out with water very much. There's a small path going right through here. Don't know if I need that or not, but I may indicate it just very slightly. I think I have enough background work there right now so I can go in with some smaller brush strokes and indicate these leaves. I'm going to scumble some blue up here on this roof because it will be picking up an influence from the sky, but I'm careful to not put too much because I want that warm color of all this sienna to keep showing through. I could have very easily put some greens out here on my palette, sap green, hooker's green, any number of greens, viridian green, but I find with my blues and yellows, I can mix up what I want and I can maintain more harmony than using uh, other greens from the tube. For me, Often less is more when it comes to colors out on my palette. Well, I'm cautiously going to start to add some lights to the structure here, keeping in mind that I don't want it to get anywhere near as light as this sky. If I were to start to get that light, it would change the whole mood of this painting. And I kind of like the mood of it as, it as it is right now. Well. As I said, I like to jump around on my painting, so I've been concentrating on this area right here. Maybe I'll work on these trees. Mix up my three colors again, but concentrating more on the blue and yellow. We'll bring those tree branches out. Those pine trees have a very soft edge on them. And when I'm working with greens, uh, of course, you know, red is the opposite of green. So these warm reds underneath really make a nice uh, departure from the greens that I'm putting over it. 
really enhances the colors of the greens by having the warm underneath. And over to the right, this Japanese maple tree has a totally different look. It's very small leaves coming off. So I'm just going to touch with just the very tip of my, or the very edge of my brush and suggest some leaves. Well, it might be time to put, start putting in some of the highlights. So with highlights, that means opaque colors. I'm squinting my eyes as I look at this and I want to work on the rocks. And I think I'll mix a warm color with some Indian yellow and white and a few of these other colors to gray it. I'll just indicate the tops of these rocks and the sides of them that are catching some light. I think I'll spray it with my atomizer and give me a soft edge. There we go. And up here, it's especially catching a lot of light, so I'll make that those strokes larger. Oh, I have this out. I could put a few highlights on this post up here. And I'm going to make it somewhat lighter than I see it, but uh, I need some good contrast in here. And this will afford me that opportunity just by pushing the values somewhat in the direction I want. You know, let's jump up to this door. Ooh, it's really getting fun putting in these details now. But if I didn't take all that preparation work to get in these lights and darks the way I wanted them to begin with, the uh, I can't jump in and do the details first. I have to do the big shapes. Let me just run some horizontal lines across this roof. This is kind of a hit and miss affair, which is what I want for putting these lines across. I don't want to show every one of these horizontal lines. They'll sort of be lost and found in there. Now I can put some verticals just to indicate a few of these slate shingles. Okay, time for a few more negative areas on the trees. I love painting negative areas. It's just really fun. It's like sculpting. You start with a big block of color and then you sculpt the tree out of it with the negative areas. I'm trying to keep in mind that these are not just dots of blue color in here, that what I'm trying to do is describe the space between the leaves and the branches. I'm trying to keep these shapes all varied. Some a little bit larger, some smaller, some going one direction, some going another. Oh, right back here too. This is a really good area to describe the edge of this building right here. So if we put a little bit of sky there, it will not only give us the negative area of the tree, but it will help us to see the edge of that tower. I'll mix more darks here and keep them a bit cool. I'm going to see if I can put those beautiful red leaves in there. I think that's everything attracted me to this composition, but those red leaves were just off, just beautiful. I'm going to put out some cadmium red light and mix that with my alizarin crimson. As these leaves come down here further, some of them turn from this rusty red to a, a rusty green almost. Right at the top, they become very brilliant because they're catching more sun, I think. The leaves are picking up a lot more of the sky color, this gray blue sky color. So I'm going to mix a purple here and put a hint of that color as I see it on the leaves down here. I don't want to get this painting too spotty with a lot of different little brush strokes. So I'm trying to keep this fairly bold at the same time, add the detail that I really like to see in a painting. Right down here, we have some black eyed Susans. I've just admired those this whole time I'm sitting here. I haven't put them in, but I think now might be the time because they are truly brilliant. So I'm picking up my cadmium yellow light and mixing it with some Indian yellow. I have to be careful putting flowers in like this, not to put in too many where the painting starts to look a little bit too flowery for my taste, but they are a beautiful feature of this whole composition. Well, I have a lot of good notes as far as color goes on this painting got the composition, I think, the way I want it. I'm going to take a photograph now. I'll meet you back in the studio and I'll show you how we can finish this. Well, here we are back in the studio here in St. Augustine, Florida. I put a few more touches on this painting. Didn't do too much to it. I just took a little time to refine this painting just a bit. It's a fairly dark painting, so I lightened the grass down here. 
Now it's only logical that this grass down here would be lighter than say the trees or the bushes because it catches the light directly that comes down from the sun. I added more color in this tree. I love that orange color, the uh, look of the fall leaves that were just starting to turn. I put a few patches of light right here on these rocks just to indicate that they curved over. The tops and the sides were a little bit different. I left this sky just the way it was. I thought I would have to go over it and paint it again to make it a little more opaque, but some of that burnt sienna color is showing through and I just like that nice warmth, so I left the sky just as it was. I mixed up cerulean blue and white. And just a touch of it I put right down here in this area and that just sort of pushed that back just enough to put it in the distance. I added more yellow flowers down in this area and although it's not the center of interest of the painting, it did add a nice uh, touch of color. And I made more contrast right here on these posts that hold the grapevines. I really kept this painting almost like it was out in the field. I only put a few touches on here, but they are the few touches that really make the difference and finishes the painting. This will make a nice remembrance of our trip to Sarah's grandfather's house. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com. If you'd like to order a copy of this episode of Painting and Travel or any one of the programs in the series, log on to paintingandtravel.com. Each DVD contains three programs and costs $19.95.